Our call to worship. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Our call to worship comes to us from Psalm 25, 1 through 9. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Do not let me be put to shame. Do not let my enemies exalt over me. Do not let those who wait for you be put to shame. Let them be ashamed to a wantonly treacherous. Make me known your ways. O Lord, teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth. Teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all day long. Be mindful of your mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me for your goodness sake. O Lord, good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, God instructs sinners in the way. God leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble the way. Leading our announcements is an update on Mary Cahoon. Those of you found out about last week, Sunday, Mary was taken to hospital and where she was being treated for complications with COVID. I would please to say that she has vastly improved during the course of the week. She is scheduled to come home tomorrow and hopefully if everything continues to look good, the numbers look good, that will happen. She thanks us for the prayers, her entire family thanks us for the prayers. And I can say with my conversation with members of the family that it has been a scary time. Just the uncertainty and the ability for this disease to masquerade like something else. So you quite, you aren't quite sure, you know, am I dealing with this or is it really something else? So I say that just for us to continue to be vigilant in our own life and practice so nothing would sneak up upon us. If you seem out of sorts, best to just get yourself checked out and don't assume that it might just be something benign because it's a very tricky disease from those who have had it and are dealing with it. The other thing that's in front of me is a article from, which paper does this come from? The Outlook. Okay. And it's a drive that seeks to replenish the food shelf. And for those of you who get the Outlook, you may be familiar with this, but the hope is, is that during the month of October, we're going to ask the community to target certain food items each day of the month of October, and we will kind of serve as 
the, the, the places, the storehouses for these items until the food shelf can, can reclaim them. And this article talks about the different things that are being targeted for each month. Like say, October 1st, it'll be cereal. October 2nd, peanut butter. October 3rd, juice. So each day has a, a food item that they invite you to, to buy and to store until the time when those items can be donated to the food shelf. We will run this in our newsletter and continue to keep this in front of you. And if you have a copy of the Outlook, you can review that and kind of get into the spirit of being able to help with the food shelf. Apparently the food shelf, and this is, I'm not sure if it's just because this year with everything being the way it is, that the needs are greater. We've always supported our food shelf and been there to meet that need. But with the, shall we say, unusual nature of 2020, there has been an even greater need for these items. So we are happy to be able to bring this to our attention and to support Utana in that very important mission. Are there other announcements that we would like to lift up this morning? Anything we should be mindful of? All right, let us pray. O oh God, you declare your mighty power chiefly in showing mercy and pity. Grant us the fullness of your grace that we, ready to obtain your promises, may become partakers of your heavenly treasure. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. We return to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 21, verses 23 through 32. Once again, we find Jesus before the chief priests, and he is in the temple. Presumably, he is teaching, providing some level of instruction to bring the people closer into communion with God, but the chief priests want to know who he's working for. We're we find ourselves in our own time, we're so concerned about credentials. Do you have the right credentials to do what you are doing? These people were concerned about Jesus' credentials. Who are you working for? Where do you get this authority from? So they come at him with their questions, and they need to know, and begins uh, a little verbal debate, a reading from the Gospel of Matthew. When he entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to join him as he was teaching and said, by what authority are you doing these things, and who gave you this authority? Jesus said to them, I will ask you one question. If you tell me the answer, then I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven, or was it of human origin? They argued with one another. If we say from heaven, then he will say to us, why did you not believe him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the crowd, for they all regard John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we do not know. And he said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. What do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work in the vineyard today. He answered, I will not. But later he changed his mind and went. The father went to the second son and said the same. And he answered, I go, sir. But he did not. Which of the two did the will of the father? They said, the first. Jesus said to them, truly, I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going ahead of the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. Even after you saw it, you did not change your minds and believe him. May the Lord bless the reading and hearing of this holy gospel. We pray. Loving, merciful God, we thank you for this time that you have consecrated and for this day that you have given us. We ask that as we enter into this sacred space, 
this sacred time, that you will continue to impart to us sound truth and a teaching that we can observe through the course of our lives. We thank you for all the experiences that you've led us through that have helped us to understand you at a deeper level. So may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be an offering to you. May you find it pleasing. Bless, keep, and guide us in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus loved a good verbal spar. I don't know if he loved it. That's, that's my editorial on it. But it seemed that he was no stranger to debates. And so here he is, he's teaching. We don't even know really what he was teaching about in the temple that day, with the exception of the fact that because he was in temple and he was teaching, the chief priests and the elders who were there, they had some problems with that. Because as far as they were concerned, since Jesus did not side with them, since he didn't take his mantle and his place amongst the great rabbis, they figured, well, he must be questionable. We don't know where he just gets this presumption from that he can just walk into our temples and start teaching. What schools did he go to? What certificates does he hold? Who authorizes and who endorses him? So they come to him with a question, and they want to try to set him up in front of all of his people, all of the crowd, because if they can nail him down as misguided, if they can nail him down as questionable, if they can show somehow that there's some level of trickery going on here, then the crowds will fall away, and they will no longer listen to him. So they come before him and they say, listen, we know who we are, and we know the pedigree of our education. But your learning is suspect. So by whose authority, whether on heaven or on earth, are you here teaching these scriptures? In a way, there's, a, there's an argument that they're trying to make that basically Jesus was a self-styled prophet, a self-styled teacher, uh, a man of self-education. Now, there's been this, in history, this debate between the self-taught individual and the person who goes through learning institutions. Now, there's a great many individuals who have applied themselves and have invented and manifested all sorts of things, and they have no formal education. So it doesn't mean that they don't have wisdom. It doesn't mean that they can't apply that wisdom and leave the world better. But we've taken it under our understanding that unless a person is endorsed by some credible institution, you know, accredited schools, then we can't trust the information that they are giving us. This is, this is the attack that they're laying on Jesus, that because he doesn't come with some list of references from approved rabbis in, in his time and place, that obviously there's something questionable about his his very teaching and this crowd that he has amassed around him. Now Jesus knows that they're trying to discredit him. They have been trying to discredit him from the very beginning, and he understands this. But he wants to teach them something. That there's lessons that they have missed. That they're so concerned about the origin of his instruction that they're missing the greater picture and the greater life that he is inviting them into. So he has a question of his own. He's like, okay, I'll answer your question, but first you have to answer mine. Don't you hate when people answer a question with a question? You're like, just answer, deal with my question first. I don't want, I don't want your question. I want my question answered first. But Jesus does this number. He's like, I've got a question of my own. And all of a sudden, his question takes precedent. He's like, okay, my question is, what do you think of John's authority. What do you think of John's baptism? John the Baptist, my favorite biblical character, at least in the New Testament. What do you think of his baptism? Was it of divine or human origin? Now this was a legitimate question because when John came, he didn't come with any credentials. I mean, the man wore clothing of camel's hair and he ate locusts and wild honey. And you can imagine that his look as intense as it was, wasn't the sort of thing that you said, yes, this is a Harvard man we're dealing with. This is a man from Yale. No, this, this is John Raggedy Taggedy Man who's out there in the wilds preaching the baptism of repentance. He looks like he is not endorsed by anybody. 
So Jesus says, okay, John had a master following. John had cultivated a new understanding of people. What do you think of his baptism? Was it divine or was it human? The chief priests had to have a huddle. They said, ooh, this is a tough question. This is much tougher than, than the question we asked him. Because if we say that John was of human origin, we're going to have a problem with, with the crowds. Because the crowds regarded him as a prophet. And if we say it's of divine origin, then Jesus is going to say, well, why didn't you follow him? Because you claim to follow the divine, you claim to follow God. So if John is out there preaching a baptism of repentance on the basis of God, why didn't you listen? So they huddle for a while and they kind of say, well, we don't know. We don't know. You got us. This John showed up. He did baptism. We don't know if it was divinely appointed or if it was human. And Jesus is like, that's my answer too. I'm not going to tell you. I will not tell you, but I will tell you a story. And Jesus loves to tell a story. So he tells us the story of a, a father who has two sons. Very good patriarchal story. Father has two sons. He goes to the first son and says, son, I want you to go to the vineyard today. And his son says, I'm not going. I am not going to go. And he runs off and he thinks about it. And later in the day, he goes to the vineyard and does some work for his father. He goes to the second son, says the same thing. I need you to go to the vineyard. And the son's like, absolutely, on my way there right now. Never shows up. Just never gets there. Somehow, one, one of those things where you go out to check the mail, and you, you, don't, you come back six weeks later. <laughs> so he just never shows up. Jesus, again, turns to the chief priests and the Pharisees who follow these sorts of stories and says, which son of the two did the will of the father? This is the first one. He says, yes. He goes, and that is why the sinners and tax collectors and the prostitutes will get to heaven before you, because they saw John, and they believed. They didn't question the origin of his baptism. They listened to his words. They saw the command and presence of his argument, and they entered into the waters, preparing themselves for the Messiah's arrival. And you sit there with your fancy learning. And you've gone over scrolls and you hide behind all your religious finery and you watch that happen and you did nothing. Even after you saw the conversion of people that you had already counted as lost, you did nothing. Now Jesus is making a very strong argument because these two sons are like the, the chosen individuals, the ones that God has set a seal upon, sons and daughters of Abraham, and then the Gentiles, and all the lost causes. And those who were already sort of in, who were tight with God, didn't want to recognize that God was doing a new thing. And those who had thought God had forgotten about them, had passed them over, all of a sudden realized that God's like, no, there's a place for you as well. And they came on in. Jesus is trying to get us to recognize this new thing that God is continuously doing. And it's not just something that happened generations ago. But that new thing continues to spring forth even for us at this very moment. The new awareness, the, the new ability, the, the opportunity to come back to an issue that we thought we had already mastered. We thought that we had already sort of solved and compartmentalized and then to see it through a new lens. And that's what Jesus was for those chief priests. He was the opportunity for the argument that perhaps the chief priests, with all of their vast learning, all of their accumulated wisdom, all of their authority and position, hadn't seen everything that God had yet to do. And so when Jesus arrived on the heels of John's baptism of repentance, that God was still springing forth a new reality. And then they rejected it because it didn't come in the manner that they thought God would manifest. Well, this can't be God because this man just walks into the temple without the proper credentials. This can't be of God because Jesus is now consorting with people that we consider sinners, tax collectors, prostitutes, Gentiles. This can't be of God because it doesn't line up with how we have come to know and understand God. And obviously, God is inflexible. 
according to the chief priests and the elders, and a lot of Christians as well, that God can't do new things because we won't let it. You can't do this new thing, God, because it doesn't fit with my understanding of you. So you need to roll it back because all this stuff that's going on here, I, 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 it can't be of you. This is human manipulation. So which son are we? Which son are we when, when God comes to us and says, I'm about ready to do this new thing and I, and I need your participation. Can you get in the work with me? Are we the ones that says, no, I want no part of this. And then we go away and we think about it a little bit and say, well, hold on, what do we have to lose? Maybe I could try this out. Maybe I could embrace this belief. Maybe I could reach out to individuals in need. Maybe I could start stockpiling food at home, not for my own sake, but for the sake of those who have fallen on hard times. Maybe I could do that. Maybe it's not that much of a stretch to buy one and add another one for a stranger. Or are we the son that says, yes, absolutely, God, I am down with you. And then head on out of church and completely forget. What's that book that we read in church? Forget its name. Um, what is it? What's the, what are they called again? The Bible? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's. Yeah, they read from it every week, but I don't know what it's about. Which son most resembles the way in which we tackle faith in the world? Are we the son that meets it with resistance at first because it sounds like too much burden to bear? I mean, I can see us. And I can understand why we push back against the gospel. Because the gospel demands, it insists change. It, it just does. The gospel has always been about change. This is exactly just the whole bulk of Jesus' ministry was about opening people's minds to the new understanding of God. So when he took his, even his own disciples, his own disciples was like, we cannot go over to this land because these are Gentile people. We can't hang out and associate with these individuals. We are now out of our territory. We're now out of our, out of our district. And they felt uncomfortable because even they had been instructed that God does not go to these areas. But because they were so attached to Jesus, they're like, well, if he thinks it's safe to go, he must know something. So they went with him. Even though their hearts and their constitution said, this feels weird. This feels uncomfortable. But we have to accept that that first son knew that if he said yes to his father, I'm going to work in the vineyard, that first of all, the thing that he wants to do, which is go and play and you know, follow his own pursuits, will not happen. He has to go to the vineyard. But he does go. We don't know how long it took for him to have his mind turn around. I mean, Jesus tells us the story like it was an instant thing, but maybe it took that son 10 years to get to the vineyard. He got there eventually, but some time had passed. See, we don't know. We don't have, Matthew doesn't give us time frames. Matthew only gives us the snippet of a son who resisted, then succumbed. A son who wanted to push back against his father's will and his father's invitation, and then submit. And then we have another son who does nothing but lip service. The second son. I need you to go to the vineyard and work for me. The son's like, absolutely, I'll be there this afternoon. I'm on my way. I'm going right now. I'm going to be there. See, I think Jesus is basically saying this second son resembles these chief priests. Oh, they've been saying yes to God until all of a sudden God did something that didn't line up with their expectations. And then, then it's a no. Lord, we go to temple. Lord, we give a tenth of all that we earn. Lord, we follow each and every one of your laws. Well, consider my son Jesus. I want you to believe in him. Lord, we can't do that. No, that's a bit too far. I mean, look at him. Look at the company that he keeps. He doesn't even have a home to call his own. Consort with all the wrong people. Doesn't even tell us what authority he operates by. 
He's supposed to be your incarnation. He is supposed to be your new chapter. See, we as people of faith need to be on guard about closing a book that is still being written. Yes, I understand that we have the canonized scriptures before us. That we have a book that has been collected by learned individuals of the past. So we like these books. We want to compile these books and make them our sacred holy texts. We talked about Ryan Myron back here. I'll tell you, there's a lot more religious texts out there. He's got a book about it. And he's read them. And so there's lots of sacred texts out there that didn't make the cut, but are still equally valid. And who's to say that we, ourselves, right now, aren't living scripture? Who's to say that we, right now, hearing the Gospels being retold and reiterated, who's to say that right now in our life, we're not writing and continuing to write that text? And the choice before us to go and work in the vineyard is still a valid question. It's still a valid invitation. And Jesus gives us that opportunity to push back against it so long as we come home later. But are we, are we the second son? Are we the individuals like, mm -hmm, I'm done for all things God, but you look really hard at our lives and you'd be hard pressed to find it? Jesus makes a good argument. He makes a wonderful argument for us to be serious about consistency in faith. And consistency is constantly always a matter of sticking claim on what we believe, laying it against our actions, and seeing if they line up. Because we could we could be we could all be in danger of saying, I go, sir, only to know that we're never going to arrive. We've lost destination, we've lost satellite reception. We can't find our way back. There's no GPS that's gonna get you to the heart of God. It's constant and continued application, rising up every day and renewing that covenant and recognizing that, that there's some point in the day where we could lose the path if we're not mindful of this God who has invited us into a greater understanding of love and service. But it is a conscious choice. And that's why this stinging rebuke against those chief priests is so severe. Because they should have known better. They had read the scriptures for themselves. They had read the prophecies for themselves. They should have been so up on Jesus' arrival and John the Baptist's message that they should have, it should have been apparent to them when it appeared in their community. They should have said, yes, this was spoken about through the prophets. Isaiah spoke about this, and here it is. And it comes and it arrives, and even though they had read about it, they didn't like the packaging that it came in, and they rejected it. And who embraced it? All the least of these. All the individuals out there who didn't know their left from their right, the, the individuals that society had given up on, tax collectors, the sinners, the prostitutes, the widows, the orphans, the lost boys and girls of first century Palestine. They got it because they had nothing left to lose. God was, was already taken from them by the authorities. So when they saw the manifestation of, of God and heard John's promise, they latched on because it gave them a tangible hope. And those who were already bathed in all the deep religious learning of their day says, it's just a fad. It'll pass. Are we there again? Are we there again? Has our religion and our faith become little more than another talking piece to demonstrate how down we are with this or that platform so we can throw God in there because it, it will shape any argument? But really that's just saying yes when really we mean no. Be on guard not to use your faith as a cudgel. Be on guard not to let our labels that we apply to ourselves as people of faith to teach the other side. 
teach this presupposed godness amongst us. Be very, very careful with these words that were given to us, that were entrusted to us. The moment they start to become a platform, the moment they start to become some pawn in a game, we're right there with those chief priests and Pharisees, looking for credentials, looking to silence the individuals who dare to speak the truth, but we don't like the truth because we don't like the packaging that comes in. We don't like the way it's being manifest. We don't like it because they're not waiting their turn and they're not minding their manners. So it must not be a God. We need to think about these things. I need to think about these things. Each and every one of us needs to go back and to weigh what it means to be a person of faith. What it means when we call ourselves Christian because I, I guarantee you right now if you let the world define your faith, you will find yourself being very confused about what it means to be in this house of worship. What happens when our faith becomes highly politicized? And then to believe makes you a patriot or unpatriotic. We have to think about these things very carefully and every day. And we can't say, well we can't say because we're individuals and we have the freedom of speech, but when we start to double down that God endorses our platform and not that of our neighbors, chief priests and Pharisees. Who is this Jesus and who gave him his authority? He's amassing a following. We don't like that. We don't like him. We're losing control of the people. He's taking them away from us. He's filling their head with nonsense and lies. By whose authority do you have these things? He's like, why don't you answer my question first? Was John divine? Or was John just making it up as he goes along? They go, we don't know. Then I won't tell you who I'm working for. Because Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice. And they know me. I pray to God and I hope to God that we will always be his sheep. <laughs>
We consume information, more information, that doesn't come from the Bible during the course of the day than comes from the Bible. So it's easy to see how perhaps we might get lost in the fray. We have foolishly used our faith for self-defense. We have used it to find ourselves against other individuals who seem to disrespect our community and our way of life. We have held you hostage, denying your love from those we disapprove of. We didn't mean to at first. We really wanted to share you, we really wanted to understand and have a desire to love and serve others, but then people just became difficult. And we had to find some way to punish them. And it just seemed easy to use you. And it was a great way for us to be able to differentiate ourselves from, you know, those other people. Then a curious thing happened. We found out that those other people were doing the same thing to us. They were defining themselves as people of faith and as Christians. And then they pointed their fingers and says, God, thank you for not making me like those people. And then we found ourselves at a stalemate and we realized that this God that was supposed to be free and accessible to all has now become a bargaining chip. So, now you've brought us back to the drawing board. Now you've forced us to realize that this is not a new issue. This is something that has been growing since time began. Two sons, one with no inclination and no desire to heed your call, another one all full of lip service and hot air. Two individuals, same father, two very different reactions. Where do we find ourselves, God? And how is it that we can reply with an honest answer to you and then to pay it forward in that neighbor that you have invited us to serve? How can we stop using you as a means to an end, as a means to cancel arguments, to bolster our opinion, to denigrate the other side. No matter what the other side means to us, there's always another side to our opinions. Help us to revisit the scriptures, the ones that truly challenge us, not that just endorse the things that we already believe, the ones that really truly challenge us, that call out our selfishness, the ones that open our eyes to the understanding that perhaps maybe, maybe, we've been worshiping all wrong. That our preachers haven't helped, religious authorities haven't helped, biblical authors haven't helped. Maybe we don't understand you at all. We'd like to, we want to. These are sobering questions. But if you give us space to answer these questions, give us the ability to ask them authentically, you break us down so we have no more emotion to resist you. And it's in those weak and broken moments that we are the most authentic. Not when we're puffed up on opinions, platforms, waving our hands about and saying, how dare they? But when we were absolutely full of confusion, emotional wrecks on the edge of our tether, when you can come in and say, now let's begin again. 
That's my prayer. My prayer is that for every single person who claims that they are down with you, that they believe and trust would begin again. Because I'd say, as a minister of your word for now a couple of decades, we've gotten a mite bit off track. And you got damaged in the process. And for that, I am sorry. But I want to learn. And I want to know you all over again. And I want my congregation and people who are affiliated with this church to know you all over again. And if you've got to break us down for us to hear you, to hear the Master's call with clarity, Okay, you got my permission. It's time for us to start listening. Really listening. Because I want us to be able to say with clarity, yes, yes, God. I don't really want to go where you want me to go. I need some time to think about it. But I'll catch you later. I want us to begin with resistance, but to settle into submission. I don't want us to say yes right now and never show up. To define ourselves as the holy ones of God, when we haven't been to church in the past 30 years, we haven't read the Bible ever. I want us to wrestle with our faith. I want you to call to us and we kick and scream and say no. Because then we know at that moment that it's real. It's real when we come with resistance. It's real when we know that you're trying to transform us. I like the lesson of that first son. He's real. He's authentic. He says, I don't have time for you, God. I've got things I want to do. I've got places I want to go. I have pursuits of my own. And then he goes on to live his life. Tries to live his life in the abandon of God. And then God slowly overtakes him as a shadow overtakes us. And then we get it. And then we realize Yes, this is true living. This is authentic living. Chances are, if it comes too easy to us, there's something shady about it. But faith should be a contest. Faith should demand from us deep, visceral change. I don't want it to come easy. Not for me, not for anyone else. I want us to because when we own it, then we know the gravity of your love for us. You think perhaps maybe that Jesus could have saved our sins by not going to the cross? Probably he could have. But would we have appreciated it as much of him breaking himself for us? There's something about a man giving up his life that really gets your attention. Instead of him coming out in fine robes and waving his hand about and saying, You're forgiven. It just doesn't seem to have the same snack as a man bleeding on a cross and saying, God forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. Well, truer words have not been spoken. God forgive us. We do not know what we are doing. But we'd like to know what we are doing. Please help us to learn what we are doing. Shake us up. Break us down. Build us up. We ask your blessing on those who are sick and suffering, especially Mary Cahoon, as she finishes the tail end of her hospital stay. May you bring her back vital, renewed. We ask a blessing upon the entire Cahoon household as other members of the family also come off this dread disease. 
lay your blessing on individuals in our greater community. Carolyn Scott, she continues to heal from a fracture. Marla Denton, she bring him peace. We ask a blessing <coughs> on even Addison Donahue, who still has six more weeks before she's tip top. And for those we name in our hearts, we ask that you can just hear our prayers. Hear our prayers in Jesus' name. Thank you for receiving these, the prayers of your people. May you receive them for the sake of he who offered himself for us and who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. I is the kingdom, the power, and the glory of our If you have your communion items ready, I'll share with you one. Church cup. We covenant with the Lord and with one another, and we bind ourselves in the presence of God to walk together in his holy ways. We will strive to be doers of the word and not hearers only, to be firm in faith, quickened in hope, and constant in charity. We will consecrate our time, talent, substance, and influence as heirs of God and joiners with Christ. Loving most merciful God, we thank you for this sacrament that you have raised for us. You've taken great pains to make sure that we can feel the impact of your salvation. So for these elements, provided for us, allow us once again to enter into that renewal, that forgiveness that you make possible. Though it came at a very high price, the gains are immeasurable. Bless, strengthen us, open our eyes in Jesus' name. On the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he celebrated the Passover meal with his disciples and took bread, blessed, divided, gave it to them and says, this is my body, which is given for you. We share the bread. Presenting them with the cup, he says, This is the cup of the new covenant. My blood shed for the remission of sins. We take the cup of life. Let's pray. Loving, merciful God, thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth finest word that we can stumble upon when we realize the length that you went to bring us to this point to self-realization self-realization to take stock of our lives and to realize that there have been some deeds in there that need to be set aside and not only do you set them aside, but you forget them. You do not remember our brokenness. You fill us with redemption. You give us self-worth and dignity. And then you send us forth. So for all of this that you have made possible through this gesture, we thank you. And we ask that we would continue to be able to operate with confidence, knowing that you have called us by name and being reminded that we are yours.
Please rise for the blessing. And now, may the Lord bless and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and grant you peace. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.